Hi, I'm Maris, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about some complications of pregnancy, including hypertensive disorders, group B strep, and amniotic fluid disorders. I'm going to be following along using our maternity flashcards. These are available on our website, leveluprn.com, if you want to get a set for yourself. And if you already have a set, I invite you to follow along with me. All right, let's get started. So first up, we're going to be talking about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. There's a few that you need to know. One of them is gestational hypertension, there's preeclampsia, there's eclampsia, and then there is HELP syndrome. So let's kind of talk about it. So in general, hypertensive disorders are going to involve hypertension, um, but they're going to cause vasoconstriction and vasospasm in the whole body, and this can lead to impaired circulation, which affects the fetus as well. So this could cause um, placental insufficiency of many different forms, uh, and, and this could cause a lot of different problems for this um, patient and their baby. So gestational hypertension is going to be um, hypertension, so a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, after 20 weeks of gestation. Um, it, it would be recorded twice, right? So one blood pressure is not diagnostic, it would have to be at least two blood pressures taken four hours apart from one another. There would be no protein in the urine though, okay, very important no protein in the urine. Now, mild preeclampsia. Um, preeclampsia is, um, is a, a, a very serious condition and it can progress to something called eclampsia. So um, preeclampsia can be mild or severe. Mild preeclampsia is going to be blood pressure over 140 over 90, um, but also we are going to have protein in the urine which can be measured at one plus. So if you've ever done a urinalysis, you like remember looking at the stick that has the different colored squares on it and protein for instance would be measured as none trace 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus. So if I have an elevated blood pressure and also 1 plus protein in my urine, that's going to be mild preeclampsia. Whereas with severe preeclampsia, I'm going to be um, experiencing even more hypertension. So I'm going to have a blood pressure over 160 over 100. I'm going to have proteinuria at or above three plus levels. Um, and then here's where you're gonna see these other really, really important star highlight underline it kind of symptoms that you need to know as warning signs. So headache, a headache uh, is very common in pregnancy, but a headache that is severe and won't go away needs to be investigated. Blurred vision is not normal in pregnancy. If your patient says that they're having blurred vision or they're seeing spots or floaters in their vision, you need to be thinking preeclampsia. If they have epigastric pain, so pain above that belly button, um, uh, thrombocytopenia, which is going to be decreased platelets, um, impaired liver function, impaired kidney function, edema and hyperreflexia. All of those things are possible signs and symptoms of severe preeclampsia. Now, eclampsia is all of that plus seizure activity. So for your patient to be diagnosed with eclampsia, they must have a seizure. So if I have a patient who is preeclamptic and in the hospital, what do I need to be thinking as the nurse? Pause the video and think about it for a second. I hope you pause the video. I need to be thinking for my preeclamptic patient that I should be instituting seizure protocols, right? I need to start implementing these now because it's possible my patient could get worse and start to seize. Okay, now, HELP syndrome, H-E-L-L-P, is actually a mnemonic in its own right. So it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, so H-E-L is elevated liver, and low platelets, L-P. So this is really, really serious. Um, and you will see it, it, with HELP syndrome, 
your patient is likely going to complain of epigastric or right upper quadrant pain because of the liver involvement. They're going to have those elevated liver enzymes like AST, ALT, um, and then they're going to have low platelets, thrombocytopenia. So that is a really big deal. So if you were to see those uh, lab values, you need to be thinking health syndrome. Okay, so now what am I going to do about it, um, right? So we've talked about what it is. What are we going to do about it? Well, the treatment is going to be antihypertensive medications, right? Um, the big ones here are going to be hydralazine and labetalol. Um, remember that ACE inhibitors um, and ARBs, angiotensin uh, receptor blockers, uh, both of those classes of drugs are contraindicated during pregnancy. So you should not be administering those medications to a patient during pregnancy. So hydralazine and labetalol, those are going to be some really go-to drugs because they're okay in pregnancy and they're going to work to bring down the blood pressure. Um, we also uh, are very likely going to be giving these patients um, uh, magnesium, right? So a patient with preeclampsia is likely to get magnesium. It's going to help to um, to calm everything down and uh, and and it's a it's a really great drug for patients who have preeclampsia. But you can have too much magnesium. And if you have too much magnesium, we can take away uh, a patient's deep tendon reflexes, including the reflex that allows them to breathe. So for a patient who is receiving magnesium, you need to be assessing their respiratory status and quality frequently. Um, pause the video and think about what is the antidote to magnesium toxicity? Okay, I hope you paused it. The answer is calcium gluconate. So if your patient is experiencing these, um, you know, decreased deep tendon reflexes, if they're breathing less than 12 times a minute, if their urine output is dropping, all of those things are signs of magnesium toxicity. We need to be really concerned about that and consider administering the antidote of calcium gluconate. Um, so patient teaching, of course, for uh, hypertensive disorders, it's gonna be um, to change their diet less less salt intake, right? Um, we also want them to limit caffeine. Um, we're going to maintain a quiet environment to hopefully prevent seizures. Uh, and these patients may also need to be on bed rest and likely need to be in the hospital for at least a little while, right, while we treat them. Okay, moving on to group B strep. So this is group B um, streptococcus, which is beta hemolytic. This is a type of bacteria that exists in um, on the skin for some people just all of the time. Um, this is the normal skin flora for some people. Some people just um, are colonized by group B strep at any given time and it causes them no problem. Um, but it can be passed to the child during the birthing process and cause life-threatening newborn infections. So even though mom can handle it just fine, it could cause a life-threatening infection in the baby. So this is tested on all pregnant patients between 35 and 37 weeks of gestation. So uh, this is done with a vaginal and, uh, and rectal swab. Um, so this is going to swab basically the whole perineum to see if the patient is a colonizer for group B strep. Um, and if they are, that's okay. Um, we're just going to treat them with antibiotics um, uh, during birth. So this would be uh, penicillin G typically or ampicillin. It's usually going to be one of those penicillin family drugs though. Um, and uh, if if I were someone who did not have prenatal care, or maybe I went into labor early, or maybe I went into labor somewhere and they didn't have my record showing that I had a negative group B strep culture, well then in that case, they would want to go ahead and treat me with it anyway, right? It's not gonna do um, any real harm to give you antibiotics if you don't need it. I mean, we don't want to do that, but it's not going to hurt the patient, but it could treat um, an unknown infection of group B strep. Um, so for um, moms who have group B strep, they could have complications after childbirth, including sepsis and chorioamnionitis. Um, and for the baby, they could develop meningitis, pneumonia, and sepsis. So really bad news infections that we don't want these babies to, to develop. So very easy swab, 35 to 37 weeks. And lastly, we're gonna talk about amniotic fluid abnormalities. So, okay, we have three here that you need to know. So we have polyhydramnios, we have oligohydramnios, and we have chorioamnionitis. So 
poly meaning many, hydramnios meaning amniotic fluid. So lots of amniotic fluid is polyhydramnios. This is going to be um, something that you might see in a patient with gestational diabetes or uh, in certain uh, fetal congenital abnormalities uh, could cause polyhydramnios. Um, we can actually, so an amniocentesis is a diagnostic procedure we've talked about, but it can also be a therapeutic procedure we can literally remove amniotic fluid from the uterus to treat polyhydramnios. Now, oligohydramnios, oligo meaning little or few, and then amniotic fluid, oligohydramnios is going to be decreased amniotic fluid volume. Um, and this could be, again, for a lot of reasons, premature rupture of membranes is going to be a big one there. Um, ureteroplacental insufficiency, so if the placenta isn't getting enough blood flow, then we could see decreased amniotic fluid. Um, and then some abnormalities of the fetus's uh, genitourinary tract can cause this as well. Remember that babies practice breathing and they swallow amniotic fluid as as well and this allows their kidneys to start processing this as urine right and they pee it back out but if the baby has a genitourinary malformation or congenital defect this may not happen they may not be urinating it back out and it could cause oligohydramnios now chorioamnionitis this is going to be an infection or uh, inflammation of the amniotic sac of the chorion and the amnion right um so this is very common in a, a patient who has had um, a genitourinary infection like maybe a, a uti for instance um, or if they had some other sort of um, infection affecting their re uh, reproductive or urinary tract they could be at risk for this um, and and this is going to cause elevated white blood cells. They may have um, a malodorous, a foul smelling vaginal discharge. But most importantly, think of this as an infection affecting the mother. We're going to see fever, right? We have that systemic response and then uterine pain as well. It's painful to have inflammation and infection. So the treatment for that one is going to be antibiotics. All right, I hope this review was helpful. This is actually it for the pregnancy um, section of the maternity deck. So next we're gonna be moving on to the labor and delivery portion of maternity, which is always exciting stuff to cover. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please like this video so that I know. I would love to hear a comment. If you have a great way to remember something, I wanna know it. And definitely be sure to subscribe so that you're the first to know when the labor and delivery content comes out next. Thanks so much and happy studying. I invite you to subscribe to our channel and share a link with your classmates and friends in nursing school. If you found value in this video, be sure to hit the like button and leave us a comment and let us know what you found particularly helpful.